Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the BioExcel webinar. This webinar will be number 58, and we are very happy to, to introduce Justin Lempool, that will be the presenter of today from Virginia Tech. He will speak about the Charm Force Field development history, feature, and implementation in Gromax. I will host this webinar together with Stephen Fair from University of Edinburgh. The presenter of today is Justin Lemko. He's assistant professor at Virginia Tech. After his PhD in biochemistry, he received the Kirschen Fellowship from the National Institute of Health for a postdoc work uh, by Alexander Mackerel, University of Maryland, Baltimore. There he contributed to the development of the drought force field polarizable force field, sorry, for nucleic acid. And since 2017, he has his own group working on polarizable, uh, on simulation, polarizable force field on amelogen protein, DNA and RNA G quadruplex at the Virginia Tech. All right, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, the opportunity to be here and uh, talk about uh, the charm force field and how we have integrated it into the Gromax simulation software. Um, today, I want to give you a, a couple of pieces of information, both some, some sort of historical and some more practical in terms of the development and use uh, of the force field. So I'll begin with a, a couple of brief notes on the charm functional form. We won't go into every bit of detail here, but just a few things that uh, are really particularly important to know about charm uh, and how to use it uh, effectively in simulations. So this is the overall uh, charm potential energy function. Um, most of this is probably familiar to you if, if you've looked at uh, potential energy equations for, for class one additive force fields, um, but I'll highlight a few things here that are a bit uh, different about charm that maybe you haven't seen if, if you haven't used the force field uh, uh, quite a lot yet. So we have here, of course, our uh, bonded or, or intramolecular terms, the internal terms of the force field, our typical harmonic interactions for bonds and angles, uh, periodic interactions for dihedrals and our, our out of plane uh, harmonic energy term for impropers. Uh, the aspects of this that I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on, we'll touch on the dihedrals, but we'll also talk about this Uri bradley term, which is an angle bending term, uh, as well as the, the use of CMAP, these two dimensional surfaces for the force field. And the remainder of the potential energy uh, form is, is shared amongst pretty much all typical biomolecular force fields. We have our, our 12 6 potential for Leonard Jones or Van der Waals interactions. And then we have a Coulomb expression for our uh, electrostatics based on point charges. And these comprise terms in the force field. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about a couple of these uh, force field terms and I'm going to give you on each of these slides um, snippets of the force field files from Gromax. Um, since that's what sort of the, the topic of today is. Uh, and I wanna start by discussing very briefly this Uri, angle, uh, Uri Bradley angle bending potential. Um, so we have our typical uh, angle bending harmonic form, which is you know the, the normal valence angle one, three interaction uh, here which is again shared by most force fields. But there's this additional sort of cross term that's used um, that connects the one and three atoms or, or um, atoms I and K, if you will, I, J, K in this example here, which is an additional harmonic term. Uh, and this is used to uh, account for things like asymmetry in stretching. Um, and it gives better reproduction of things like infrared spectroscopy, uh, the, the spectra that come out of IR experiments. Um, and so this is something that allows us to, to very nicely capture those kinds of asymmetries. And you'll see there are additional force field terms associated with this. You have your typical sort of equilibrium angle in reference for theta zero and the stiffness of the force constant of that, which goes into the first part of this term, the traditional uh, uh, angle bending term. But then some of our angles, not all of them, but some of them have this additional reference distance, which is given here as this S sub naught um, here, uh, shown in nanometers uh, as is Gromax convention. Uh, and then you have a force constant associated with that as well, or a stiffness parameter. 
Um, and so not all of our angles, as I said before, are represented in this way. Um, they are all a Uri Bradley term, but some of them have zero uh, constants associated with that, that secondary term uh, because they are suitably represented without them. So for instance, here is the indole ring uh, on the side chain of tryptophan. Uh, one of these angles here um, is represented by having this, this cross term, uh, the other is not. So this would be just uh, sort of a standard harmonic interaction. So you'll see a mixture of these in the force field. Um, this is implemented as angle function five in Gromax uh, to indicate that we might have this auxiliary term. One of the other pieces about charm that's perhaps a little bit different than other force fields is that it allows for the summation over um, several multiplicities for each torsion. You can have multiple dihedral terms uh, on each uh, torsional angle. So for instance, I've shown here, this is an asparagine side chain. Um, the highlighting may not be the greatest, highlighted a little bit in green here, uh, but the, the force field terms associated with this uh, chi two dihedral in the side chain. Um, the atom types are listed here. This is function type nine, which is just the Gromax way of saying it's a periodic dihedral. However, you can allow for multiple terms uh, for each one. Otherwise the default behavior is to overwrite the previous uh, parameter with something new, if it were simply a, a type one, for instance. Uh, and each of these uh, torsion terms has a, uh, a value of phi, which is this, this uh, phase angle here. Uh, has an amplitude or a force constant k, which is shown in the, in the equation here, and then a multiplicity or, or the number of minima that occur in a rotation of 360 degrees. So this is a, a standard cosine functional form for, for dihedrals that most force fields use. But the difference here with charm is that we can allow for several multiplicities, which can each have their own phi. This could be zero or 180, doesn't really matter. Um, and then their own force constants associated without overwriting them. We're actually just summing over all of these terms uh, to give the, the complete representation of that dihedral. And one thing that's very important here is these, these third neighbor interactions or, or one, four pairs. Um, and in charm, these are not scaled. Uh, different force fields might apply different scaling constants like, like a half or something like that. Um, and these are intimately linked with dihedrals. Um, you can't have one without the other. And this is one of the reasons why things like dihedrals are not really transferable across force fields, right? I can't just take, you know, I've got a, a set of parameters in charm for a given torsion and I wanna use it now in amber. That wouldn't work because each of those force fields have different scaling factors that are applied uh, to these one, four interactions. And really a dihedral is simply a correction factor for inaccuracies in our ability to model non-bonded interactions at such short range in, the, in those one, four interactions. There's really no fundamental force or anything that comes out of quantum mechanics or any other theory for a dihedral rotation, except for Gauche interactions among the, the third neighbors or the one fours. And so, so these are intimately linked. Now we do have some occasions where there's a specific uh, pair type for a one, four interaction, a different Leonard Jones, sometimes maybe an alkanes or something in the charm force field. I'm not gonna go into that here today, um, but suffice to say that um, given this convention of using a, a essentially unscaled or a scaling factor of one, um, that necessitates the consistent use of dihedral parameters. And so along with dihedrals, we have these um, two-dimensional, we call C maps or, or correction maps to energy surfaces. You see these implemented as these huge matrices of constants uh, in, the, in the charm force field files implemented in Gromax. Um, they're actually a similar format in the charm force field itself within charm. What these are, are energy offsets along phi psi space, which is shown here. This is a snippet from the 2004 paper um, from, from Alex, Michael Feig and, and Charlie Brooks. Um, these are the, the intrinsic energy surfaces and the corrections that are applied to them uh, in the molecular mechanics calculations so that you get this final energy surface, uh, you know, in Ramachandran space here, phi and psi, uh, for different dipeptides. Now this one is alanine dipeptide, uh, but they did this for, for glycine and proline as well shown here. The, the genesis of this is that it's very difficult to treat torsions that are coupled um, with simple dihedral terms. There, there's a lot of factors here that 
uh, are difficult to represent uh, using simple classical mechanics. And so if we use these energy offsets, which are, have certain characteristics, they're smooth and continuous and therefore differentiable, so you can get forces via interpolation, um, it gives us a better energetic representation of the polypeptide backbone. Uh, now, this could be applied to any two-dimensional, you know, any coupled torsions, but you'll see this most, most prominently used in the charm force field in uh, the protein backbone. So you will see these different atom types uh, linked around this central alpha carbon that give us a correction factor for, for uh, phi and psi. And so this gives us a better balance um, in terms of uh, secondary structure preference. Uh, and this was, uh, I don't have a separate slide on this, but this was part of the uh, refinement in the CHARM 36M force field. Uh, we had some problems out here with uh, left-handed helical balance in like polyglycine and things like that uh, and other intrinsically disordered proteins that necessitated a small correction out here, but we left the rest of the, the CMAP surface alone. Um, so that's, that's part of things, you know, the, the charm force field developers are still tinkering with as needed. Um, of course, there were a couple of other small corrections in charm 36M, but one of the big ones was an adjustment out here in this, this left-handed alpha helical space. I want to make a brief note here about the non-bonded forces. There's not a whole lot to say, like I, like I mentioned before, you know, using a standard Leonard-Jones potential Coulomb equation um, for our non-bonded forces. But one of the things that is uh, intrinsic in the charm force field is the use of a, a force switching function. Um, you have to dig back a little bit into the literature to find the, the actual functional form of this, but I'm putting it here simply for, for sort of educational purposes. Uh, this is what it looks like in terms of switching the uh, Van der Waals forces or the Leonard Jones uh, equation, I should say. Um, we have full strength, so just the scaling factor is one uh, within some cutoff. And then there's this switching function that's applied between that cutoff and an ultimate sort of truncation distance. Okay, and so what that looks like in practice, um, this is one of the things that, that's really important for getting this right. Um, I've got the charm commands here on the left. So if you're a charm user, this might look a little familiar to you. Uh, and then the equivalent Gromax settings here on the right. So the Gromax folks might have seen this. Uh, we have this up on the Gromax website as part of a manual because it was sort of a frequently asked question for a long time. Uh, and so, so I put it here uh, and, and on the website as well um, so that the folks are getting this right. Now, uh, we'll mention in a, in a little bit here the use of, of Leonard Jones PME for, for the, the Leonard Jones interactions, which sort of removes this cutoff necessity, but um, for sort of historical purposes and for general use in the force field, these are the settings that people use and we recommend uh, when using this, this normal truncation scheme. I'll also mention here, which is a point that's often confusing for folks, um, dispersion correction is turned off when using the charm force field, except in the case of, of using the charm 36 force field with lipid monolayers um, to get the, the surface area right for the lipids, you need dispersion correction. But part of the parameterization is actually to account for uh, what we're losing in terms of dispersion interactions. We, we repeat calculations with longer cutoffs to uh, correct for how much energy we're losing. So there should be no additional uh, correction applied during your simulations, except in the case where you've got a lipid monolayer, that's, that's it. So if you've got a protein in solution, nucleic acids, whatever, uh, these are the appropriate settings. If you've ever followed me on the Gromax mailing list or now the user forum, this is something I harp on, getting your non-bonded settings right. So I wanted to put that here for everyone. And so I wanted to give a couple of notes here about the parameterization strategy of CHARM. This is also another really sort of frequently asked question. You know, I've got this ligand, I have, you know, some skeleton topology. How do I refine it? How do I improve it? Um, so I wanted to hit some of the high points of, of the really critical things that you need to do uh, to parameterize something to be consistent with the CHARM force field. So this is the overview of our workflow. Um, and it all starts with, with an, an optimized quantum mechanical geometry here. Uh, we always start from this as, as uh, step one. If we have parameters for a similar compound, we will assign them by analogy. If not, we have to come up with them de novo, um, but to the extent possible, we try to um, uh, use things that already exist in the force field. That initial topology will then go into our, our um, optimization loop, if you will. Uh, we do a bonded optimization that looks at the, the 
geometry of the molecule, how do our bond lengths and angles and things compare against that QM optimized geometry. We look at vibrational frequencies for getting our force constants right. All those K values I showed you in, in a few slides ago. Uh, and if we've got the internals reasonably uh, well uh, fit, we can move on to an electrostatic optimization. So this is your charge assignment. Uh, and we look at quantum mechanical dipole moments. Um, I'll have some, some details on that in a little bit. Uh, and then water interactions, individual interactions with water molecules. And then we'll move on to dihedral parameterization because again, dihedrals, as you recall from a few slides ago, these are intrinsically linked with the one, four non-bonded interactions. So we have to make sure once we've got these charges set that you know things are still looking good or if there are refinements that are needed, we need to be um, tuning our dihedrals. And you'll note too that at every step here, I've got this arrow back. It's all iterative, right? A force field is a self-consistent entity. Um, you, you can't have one piece be really good and one piece be really bad and cross your fingers and hope that it works. Um, while there is some error cancellation in some of this, we try to get each of these things as accurate as possible on their own uh, while recognizing that if I make one change here at this last step, I need to be looking back at all these other things. If I change a dihedral and that changes a torsion angle, does that impact my bond and geometry? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Uh, how might that be linked with the valence angles? Because it's all connected, okay? So it's an iterative process until we get to our final model that we can empirically validate. And that would be in, in uh, small molecule systems, biomolecular systems, and that kind of thing, whatever we have actual experimental data for. So as an example here, and I thought it was rather fortuitous, this, this came up on the Gromax forum the other day. Someone was looking at a similar compound to this, and it brought me back to my first days in, in Alex McCrell's lab, uh, working on Siege and FF as a, as a training exercise. So I've got my, my molecule here. This is methyl benzoate. Uh, this is the first thing I ever parameterized. Um, so a little walk down memory lane here. Um, but this is a comparison here of the QM optimized geometry here with the blue carbons and then the initial molecular mechanics geometry with the green carbons. So you can see it's not bad, but you know the geometries don't quite align, which means we've got some tuning to do in terms of different uh, force field parameters that I'll show you in a minute. But these optimizations are done with, with a model chemistry shown here. So we're MP2631G star uh, model chemistry for all of our optimizations, energy calculations, dipole moments, that sort of thing. And we want to check this geometry, these bond lengths, all the angles, every geometric aspect of this to see if we're uh, correct as far as our initial parameters that we get from the force field that we're assigning by analogy or that we're creating. And this may require some tuning, of course. And then we can look at uh, things like the vibrational frequency analysis, uh, which you can do as um, you can do that in the quantum mechanical software. You can do that in, in Charm quite easily. Um, and that will help us to decide what the force constants are and, and tune them there. And I'll note here too, that the, the quantum mechanical geometry is what we use for all the initial steps of parameterization. Uh, and that means we're fixing our molecule in the QM geometry after we've done this initial check. Reason being, if you have error in the geometry, it's gonna throw off all your other calculations. You're not gonna be able to calculate other you know, dipole moments and things like that. Um, that are actually relevant uh, to the parameterization. So we fix everything in the QM geometry first to do the next set of calculations that I'll tell you about. Then we go back after everything is refined and repeat everything, allowing the system to relax so that we're in the MM geometry and making sure that we have things um, consistent and, and that the force field reproduces uh, good properties. So for the electrostatic fitting, this is, this is charge assignment. Um, and we can use um, as a sort of guiding point or a starting point if we, if we need to, um, MERS-Coleman charges, which can be printed out by a lot of QM software. Um, this gives us a, a sort of initial guess at the charges, or we take them by analogy. And at this point, the, the comprehensive nature of the charm force field allows us to do a lot of things by analogy. We have most of chemical space covered uh, at this point so that we can sort of piece molecules together like little Lego building blocks and then refine slightly based on the exact chemical nature of the compound. And so to check this or, or to refine this, we're initially going to target this, this MP2631G star dipole moment. 
and we want to overestimate it a little bit. Now, there's no exact number here that it's going to be overestimated, but because we're looking at a gas phase quantity, but we're going to be using it principally in a condensed phase application, if we're talking about the biomolecular type simulations, you want to overestimate this dipole because that reflects the condensed phase polarization response, right? Put a molecule into water, it polarizes as a function of being in that aqueous medium. And so that's what we're looking at here. Now, there's a range of values, but ballpark of about 20% or so overestimated is, is where most things are in the force field. And then we want to check these. You know, so we've got the dipole moment. Maybe we, we adjust the charges a little bit there. But you can solve a dipole moment with a, a large number of solutions, probably infinitely many solutions in terms of charge assignment. Now, we don't just sort of assign whatever charges we want, but you need to check the individual interactions with the functional groups. And that's where these water interactions come in. So we're doing a rigid scan or, or a single degree of freedom optimization uh, along the hydrogen bonding distance for each one of these interactions. We don't do them all simultaneously, it's one by one. Um, so this is just all the possible water interactions that we consider here for this methyl benzoate system. You know, so you see on this, this oxygen atom here, we've got this linear hydrogen bond. We've got one that's a hydrogen bond off of where a lone pair might actually be. Now we don't have uh, lone pairs here in, in this topology, but you know, there, there would be in real chemical systems. So we're checking all these things, checking the out of plane, this one water up here is out of plane from this oxygen. So we do all of these because we wanna look and see just how, how well we agree with the quantum mechanical geometries and interaction energies um, with our force field model for each specific functional group. So we do this at, at, you know, it's a fixed geometry of the compound. It's a fixed water geometry of tip 3P, which is what we're assuming is being used with the charm force field. So you're literally only optimizing the distance here. It's, a, it's an internal coordinate optimization rather than a full relaxation of the system. And once we have that optimized geometry, we do a single point energy interac interaction energy analysis using a hartree fock method. Now this is quick and cheap and easy to use, um, but because, you know, this is now ignoring things like electron correlation and dispersion interactions, you have to adjust this a little bit. And, and we use, you know, reference data from like the water dimer to, to decide, you know, how much we're gonna change these values. The, the interaction energy minimum, uh, sorry, the position of the, of the interaction energy minimum gets shifted inward a little bit, 0.2 angstrom. And then in the case of neutral compounds, neutral compounds only, we scale this interaction energy by 16% or multiply by 1.16 to make it just a little bit stronger. And that's gonna be accounting for those missing interactions or the missing sort of physical properties in this model chemistry. We don't do that for charged compounds. We find that this, this type of calculation is sufficient for things that carry charge. You don't wanna overscale those and make them too strong. Okay, so um, these are the, the adjustments that we make to account for some of the missing factors in this QM model chemistry. And in this last step, we have the, the dihedral optimization. Again, same model chemistry that we use for all of our optimizations. We start with our, our QM optimized geometry back from step one. And then we typically scan one degree of freedom, one torsion, um, either zero to 180, if it's fully symmetric, save on calculation time, or the full range here, zero to 345, with of course 360 and zero being equivalent. You don't need to do both of those calculations uh, in increments of 15 degrees. So you're going to just take and scan along one dihedral in intervals of 15 degrees and allow other degrees of freedom to relax. So the only thing you're truly constraining is the target dihedral. And then we offset that to zero, and we find the global minimum in that scan. Uh, and we offset it to zero because the absolute energies are not really important to us. You know, the QM software will give you some crazy high value in, in Hartree or something, but that includes all the nuclear electron interactions, electron electron interactions. Those are the things we're not modeling in, in classical mechanics. We're looking at the relative configurational energy of that system. And that's what matters for us in the fitting. Um, we usually ignore values that are larger than 12 um, kcal per mole. So you can see this scan here for, for this torsion in methyl benzoate. Um, the initial, you know, so the QM values here in black, the initial guest parameter or the, the parameter by analogy here um, in the red. So not awful, but not, not, not exactly optimized. And then after a fitting protocol, we can recover this blue line and the parameters for this are, are down here. Um, so again, this is the first dihedral I ever fit, which is kind of a fun experience. And you can get this, this kind of agreement. And this was the best we could do. You couldn't exactly align it, but this was as close as we could get.
Okay. And so then after doing all this fitting, you know, we're going back and we're checking the dipole moments of the optimized geometry look good. Do the water interactions look good now with a fully MM relaxed geometry? We've got to do all of those checks to make things, make sure things are consistent. And then validation, you know, we move into small molecules. We don't just dump these things into, you know, proteins and, and hope it works. We look at small molecules. We're looking at liquid properties, densities, dielectrics, that sort of thing. Heats of vaporization, which is a measure then of the non-bonded strength between all the atoms, all the molecules. Um, free energy is solvation for a molecule if we have it. Sometimes we have that value, sometimes we don't. Um, we can look at uh, other condensed phase systems, solids, crystals. There's huge, huge crystal database of things. And this is where we can look at the internal geometries and the packing of these uh, molecules. Are we getting the lattice parameters right? Are we getting the molecular volume right? Uh, this is also an area in which if we have to sort of adjust the, the bond lengths or something, if the QM is a little bit different than the empirical data, we might make a compromise here in terms of bond length, surveillance angles or something. Uh, there's always a little bit of interplay between the observed values and experiments and, and the QM. Uh, it's not solely QM driven, um, there's, there's a little bit of uh, adjustments that may be made here for not reproducing good geometries. And something that people are using a whole lot right now for small molecules is the charm general force field or CGNFF. Uh, these are the three sort of really foundational papers uh, about CGNFF. So if you're not familiar with the details of all of this, uh, I don't have time to, to tell you everything about every one of these papers. I wish I did, but that would be a day long workshop rather than an hour long webinar. Um, so please refer here uh, for all the, the details. But essentially what's happening in this algorithm, so there's, there's the CGNFF force field itself, the parameters, the topologies and all that. And there's also a program that was written in Alex McCrawl's lab that will assign those topologies to, to your molecules. So there's a CGNFF program that goes through this algorithm shown here um, that will assign the, the, the initial topology for you. Uh, so you input a MOL2 file. We'll talk about that just a little bit here um, to identify the chemical elements, how things are bonded, um, identifying rings and, and hybridization state that helps with, with parameter assignment. Um, looks for, then it looks for things like aromaticity, higher order bonds, so your double and triple bonds. Um, that helps in atom typing here in the next step. And once we have the atom types, then we can start populating bonded parameters. Um, so taking things, you know, do we have that parameter already in the force field? If so, good, keep going. If not, what's the closest match? Uh, and then assigning things by, by analogy to existing pieces of the force field. Uh, and then once we have all the internals, we assign charges, okay? Because at that point, you know, the atom types, they give you your Leonard Jones. These are your bonded parameters that give you all the internal terms. And then we can assign charges. Again, this is done by analogy. Um, and there's, there's some really, really uh, intricate information given in this last paper about how those, those partial atomic charges are assigned by the program. Okay, you can access the server here at this, this URL below. Um, this is where it's currently located. Um, and it's, it's free for everyone to use. Um, and, and you can upload a MOL2 file and return a, a charm topology. Uh, and this is what it's doing behind the scenes. All right, so delivering on, on the title of the, the talk here. So the charm force field in Gromax, the implementation, how we use it. And I'll conclude with a, a practical example that, that often comes up uh, and some notes for, for folks to how to navigate some of the things you need to do here. Uh, so this is also distributed by, by Alex McCrell on his website. Um, the URL is given here. Um, so clicking on his Charm Force Field page, there's a heading for Gromax. Uh, our current release is from July 2021. Um, it was it was just released about last month, but we've we versioned it July 2021. That's when the actual Charm Force Field itself was was publicly released, uh, and we have two versions of that that are available. And these are noted on the website. We have our our sort of standard, if you will, Charm Force Field. And then we have the secondary one that's got this LJPME, so the Leonard Jones PME. Um, this is now supported. Um, Gromex has had this algorithm implemented for, for several years now, um, but there is a refinement of uh, the lipid parameters and a few topologies here uh, in this, this very, very recent paper out of Jeff Clauda's group. Um, so there's some changes to uh, charge assignment in some of the lipids, some, some internal parameters and things like that, some atom type, some Leonard-Jones differences. Um, these are now in 
in this uh, distribution, okay? Uh, and I should note too, that if you're gonna be using these lipids, uh, it's fully compatible with the rest of the force field. You can use Leonard Jones PME with the other aspects of the force field and they work just fine. Um, there are a couple of changes in, in this version. We have a, a, a new automated build system that Andras did that's beautiful. It's, it's way better than the stuff we used to have. Um, and I really appreciate his contributions here in, in getting this working. And what this does is it organizes the force field way better. It prevents uh, having to do some manual edits and things that I used to have to go through and check. And um, so you now have more of a conventional Gromax feel to this. Um, where each biomolecule type, you know, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, they have their own RTP and TDB files and that sort of thing um, for a more intuitive look uh, for the force field files and for easier use with, with PDB to GMX rather than these sort of monolithic merged files we used to have because converting from the charm force field is, is not, a sec not exactly easy. <laughs> and uh, so, it, you know, rather than trying to code in well, what belongs where, we didn't. <laughs> and so we had a merged file um, that he is very uh, smartly split into more user friendly things. Um, this force field distribution, it, it only includes the Charm 36M for proteins. Um, our older distributions allowed you to switch back to the old Charm 36. So, so this one doesn't. Um, this has become sort of the standard for, for the Charm force field for proteins. If you want to use the old protein force field, we maintain an archive uh, at this link uh, on Alex's website of the old distributions. Um, but one of the things you can do in the current July 2021 version is use this modified tip 3P that they used in the, the Nature Methods paper where they parameterize this force field. Um, it's got a modified epsilon on the hydrogen atoms of water, uh, which make the interactions between the water and a solute uh, a little bit stronger. And that helps unfold these like intrinsically disordered proteins and things. Um, so that gives you an expanded radius of gyration, better properties, that sort of thing. Uh, and these are NB fixed back uh, for water water interactions so that all the, the water water interactions are normal. Um, and so that that allows you to, to switch that on and off if, if that's something you want to test and, and try in your system. So that's that functionality has been added. So validation testing is really, really important, of course. We have to make sure these things are equivalent uh, between Charm and Gromax. Um, we run through a battery of, of a test suite here. Um, I build polypeptides that have all the, the canonical amino acids, oligonucleotides, sugars, lipids, uh, a couple of other ad hoc systems like water and salt solutions and stuff to make sure all of our ND fixes are working. Um, and then we just compare the energies. Now, of course, I have gone in and compared the forces as well on all the atoms for a subset of systems. They always come out fine. Um, it's easier to look here at, at single numbers. Um, so the agreement here is quite good. We usually are down into the third decimal place in the potential energy. Uh, some of this comes from using slightly different um, uh, Coulombic constants in the different uh, software. Uh, actually, every biomolecular software package uses a different value for this, so they're all slightly different, um, which is a little annoying. But if you know that's the source of your error, that's, that's what's happening. Um, and we've done the breakdown of all the different energy terms and, and they all match up. It's, it's usually just the, the electrostatics that are a slight bit off, um, but they agree. And so the, the force field implementation is robust uh, and we get agreement between the different packages. So how do you use it? How do we use Charm 36 in Gromax? There's a couple of routes you can take. Um, one is the online Charm GUI, uh, which is a really, really highly functional um, web server. I'm not just saying that because I contributed to this particular paper, but it really is great. Um, it allows you to basically do all the things that Charm does and then output um, uh, files that are compatible with all kinds of different uh, simulation software, whatever your, your favorite software might be, um, whether it is Gromax or something else. Um, so what it's doing is it's running Charm under the hood. Um, and it's making use of all the things that Charm can do, which include an internal coordinate builder for building on modifications and terminal patches and things like that, which is the other thing that's really handy in Charm is this on the fly patching, um, modifying residues, making cyclic peptides, cross-linking, whatever it is. Um, you have all of these things that Charm does because Charm is a script-based program. You can just step-by-step step say, okay, here's how I wanna change my system, do this, do this, do this. And then it will output for you a coordinate file, the corresponding topology, and then whatever subset of the force field you need to simulate that system. And I highlight that here because 
you know, a, an issue that people run into, especially with, with using things in Gromax is they say, oh, well, I built this really complicated system and now I wanna add a ligand to it. And then all of a sudden there's a bunch of missing atom types or parameters or something. It's because it doesn't give you the full charm force field. It just gives you what you need for, for simplicity's sake. Um, and so just realize if you're modifying things from charm GUI, you're gonna have to modify or augment the force field parameter files in, in most cases. So how do we match that natively within Gromax? There's all these things that, that Charm can do that Gromax really can't. Um, and so that is combining things into uh, pre-built RTP entries. Uh, we don't have, for instance, there's no phosphoserine defined in Charm. There's serine and then a patch that will adjust that topology to become phosphoserine. So we had to combine that into an RTP entry by marrying together the residue definition and the patch to make a residue. And so those are the things we've got in place here. Um, same thing with the hydrogen uh, building database, the HDB files. Um, that's sort of the extent of PDB to GMX's internal coordinate builder is it can build hydrogens on. Uh, and then uh, Termini database, the TDB files that are the, the sort of terminal patching. And all this runs through PDB to GMX like anything else. Our Charm 36 port that has all these features um, will give you your coordinates and topologies in, in Gromax compliant format. So I wanna spend a few minutes uh, going through a practical example. Now, this is a tutorial I wrote a few years ago. It's been online uh, for a while. It's down, linked down here if you wanna go through it. Uh, maybe some in the audience have, maybe you haven't. Um, but an example here is, is something people encounter quite frequently is I've got a protein ligand complex and I want to run a simulation of it. Maybe it's a drug, maybe it's an endogenous molecule or whatever it happens to be. How do I deal with that? So PDB to GMX, of course, can, can handle the protein just fine. The ligand itself has to be treated differently um, because in all likelihood, we're not going to have an RTP entry for that ligand in the force field already. We've got a bunch of model compounds from CGNFF, but those are not usually full on uh, drugs or ligands or cofactors. So we have to run that through the CGNFF program. So, so visit that URL I gave you before the, the CGNFF uh, server. And when we have that topology, we can combine that into our system topology and then continue on preparing things like we would any other Gromax system, solvate it, add ions, whatever you wanna do to it to give you your, your uh, input system for the MD simulation. This is the part that trips people up sometimes, and, and we have, you know, some stumbling blocks here that, that hopefully I'll help people get through um, uh, today as I talk about the, the protocol here. So just a, a, a bit more detail on generating a CGNFF topology. Uh, you need a syntactically correct MOL2 file. Um, this can be a bit of a challenge. There's lots of programs that will write out MOL2 files. The, the quality of some varies. They're usually pretty good, but occasionally you'll find some problems. Um, uh, so, so MOL2 file is going to have all the atom names. Um, it will assign these, these Sybil MOL uh, atom types uh, to each of the atoms. Uh, we use this in CGNFF for some of the initial per, uh, atom typing that's done. Um, there are bonded connectivities here, what atoms are bonded to what, and then what type of bond. Is it a single bond? Is it an aromatic bond? That kind of thing. Uh, and if you have non-unique atom names, which is often the case when, when programs export these things, uh, CGNFF is gonna reassign those. So anything that's a duplicate, it's gonna assign its own name to. So that doesn't really matter. Um, it's a little inconvenient to have this in the first place, but um, for the purposes of the output, it's not a big deal at all. Um, the atom typing assignment, that, that's really critical. Um, sometimes there's, there's some weird things that happen here, or, or if a user is creating one of these on their own, uh, there may not be a correct assignment. So uh, occasionally the server will return an error, in which case you need to revisit you know, the assignment of the atom types or the connectivity. You know, it'll, it'll freak out if you have like five bonds to a carbon or something like that, in which case you need to sort of do your bookkeeping a little bit better uh, down here. And then what does that give you? Um, the CGNFF program will give you a charm compatible topology or, or stream file. That's what the STR uh, suffix is on that file. And so this is a residue definition in charm format. So it's got your atom names, the types that it's assigned to them, the charges. And then the great thing about CGNFF, and I think this is one of the most useful features, is it gives you a penalty for each of these, these charges and each of the parameters that it assigns, which we'll look at in a moment it tells you where you might need to have some caution in using the topology. Maybe there's some refinement necessary. 
Now here, this particular molecule, and so what's gonna print out up here is the largest penalty for the parameters. So your bonds, angles, dihedrals, and then the largest penalty for the charge. Um, the header of the topology gives you some guidance on this. You know, if it's less than 10, you're probably fine. Um, 10, or almost certainly fine. 10 to 50, you should probably double check it. And anything over 50 is basically like, we don't think this is a very good assignment. Um, it's really a confidence score. How confident is the program that the analogy is, is reasonable for your purposes? Okay, so these parameter, these charge penalties are all super small. So I'm not worried about this. I think this is a good topology and I'm not gonna play with it. You could do some basic validation, but being a rather hydrophobic molecule, pretty much the only thing you're gonna do is a water interaction around this hydroxyl, which has extremely low penalties anyway. So there's not a whole lot I'm probably going to do with this uh, anyway. Uh, coming down here, these are the two dihedrals that, that are identified as not previously existing in the force field, not, you know, not an exact match based on the atom typing. You can see though the atom types it assigns and where it drew the, the uh, parent parameter from. So again, these are super close in terms of the chemical nature of all of these and the, the penalties are below one. And you know, below one, you're not gonna do any better than that. So these, you're not gonna need to touch. And in any case, you know, the, the dihedrals that I'm talking about here are, are generally, you know, this first one is, is not even really rotatable because the central bond is in an aromatic ring. Um, so it's not going to deviate very much anyway. Um, and then the other one is, is out here to the alkyl group. But again, very small penalty. It looks just like any other alkane uh, and it's, it's, it's going to be a good match. So in this case, I'm not going to do any kind of refinement to this. If you have massive penalties here, well, if you have large penalties, you know, you should double check things. If you have massive penalties, then you need to do some parameterization work, which was the, the second topic today uh, and how you would go about doing that. And one thing that, that trips folks up is, is our conversion script itself. This is again, a, a program available from Alex's website. Um, it's not exactly named CGNFF, Charma GMX. It's got some suffixes here with which version of Python and which version of the network X package you need. Um, please pay attention to that. It's like the number one thing that people um, have problems with is getting the right combination of these things. Um, and, and the versioning uh, is, is always a bit of a headache for us because things are constantly changing in these versions. We tell you what we test with. If you have issues, please let me know. Uh, we'll see if we can work something out. It's, it's sort of something we're always tinkering with. Uh, but what you need to provide to this, this conversion script is the residue name, the original MOL2 file, the, the topology from CGNFF, the stream file, and then the location of the CHARM36 force field distribution that you're using. The reason this is, uh, the first three files go together into a sanity check. Does this residue name exist? Sometimes they get changed, so be aware of that. Um, is it correctly matching between the MOLE2 and the stream file? The MOLE2 and the stream file are checked for consistency in terms of the order of the atoms, and that gives you a PDB file, right, that you can then use in Gromax. Now, the stream file and the force field are then uh, sent through a version check to make sure we have consistency between the version of CGNFF, the, the force field version, and what is included in the charm force field distribution that we've given you. And I'll, I'll get to that on the next slide. But if all of that passes, you get a topology, uh, a, a system topology, a ligand topology, and then an auxiliary parameter file um, for that ligand. And so this is just a listing of, of what those are. Um, this initial coordinate file, you can go ahead and use this directly in your simulation of the, the protein ligand complex or just in solution. Um, standalone topology, this is useful for running, you know, if you want to do a free energy calculation or something in, in water, um, this would be what's used. Um, then the ITP file, like most other Gromax ITP files, contains the molecule type definition of the ligand. Uh, and this is one that people often wonder what it is, PRM. This is sort of just charm nomenclature for a parameter file, PRM. It's just a Gromax ITP file. And that has in it any of the new parameters that were introduced for your ligand. So if new things had to be generated by analogy, they're in here because they're not gonna be in the parent force field. And that is, is placed very specifically in your topology. The, for, the, the tutorial I have walks you through this. It's gotta appear immediately after the force field because all of the force field terms have to be declared and known before you can introduce any molecule type. Um, so it's got to be sort of right up here at the top of the topology, right after the force field inclusion statement. And why do we do this check? Why are we making sure this is consistent with the parent force field, right? Well, 
I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'll say it to the day I die. A force field is a self-consistent entity. You can't mix them and match them, okay? Say for instance, a couple years ago or whatever, you generated a ligand uh, stream file. And that was with CGNFF version 4.4 or 4.3 or whatever it happens to be. The, and you want to use it in conjunction with our latest force field because of you know whatever reason, because you've got modified amino acids that are in this version or, or whatever. We're now distributing the force field with CGN of F version 4.6. And it's going to be you know having these specific versions of, of non-bonded and bonded parameters. There could be a clash here. Perhaps in the development of CGN FF, we have now refined and implemented some parameter that was previously guessed in your topology. And if you do this include statement in this order, if it exists in the parent force field, it will be overwritten by the one in your topology uh, or your, your parameter file from that topology. And you're using then a suboptimal or unoptimized parameter potentially, okay? Maybe you've already refined it and the agreement's pretty good and you're not really doing a change, but we do this to, to help people from, you know, making mistakes. We don't want you to be using an outdated parameter when we have actually parameterized this and made it a lot better. Okay. So that's the version check. That's something that trips people up sometimes. Sometimes the, the differences in the versions are not, not, you know, super large, but you've got to have pretty intimate knowledge of the development history to make that call. So we just say, look, you need to be using the same version uh, of, of CGNFF from the server as with the force field distribution that we're giving you. All right, so with that, I want to conclude and um, you know thank the folks that, that gave me all of my, my charm and Siege and FF knowledge from my time at, at Maryland. Of course, my advisor, Alex McCrell, um, Prabhu Rahman, who worked very closely with me in developing the original uh, charm to grow Max port. Um, of course, Ken Ovenomislaga, who's the, the main developer and driver of, of Siege and FF. He was a huge help in, in teaching me all the ins and outs of the force field. Um, Andras did a, a beautiful job of, of writing this new conversion uh, program based on the one we had been using, which was really clunky. Um, of course, thanks to my group, who's always testing and using these force fields and things, uh, the folks that fund the work. Uh, and again, thank you for the invitation here today, and uh, I'll be happy to, to take any questions at this point. Thanks for the talk, Justin. It was, it was really good. Uh, yeah, so we're going to do questions now. So the way it works is I'm, I'm just going to read out the, the questions that you guys have put in the q and I apologize in advance when I pronounce your name wrong. <laughs> so, right, we'll begin with a question from Athol Suresh, which is, how are the energy corrections in CMAP determined for each residue? Is it based on comparing with experimental data or quantum mechanical calculations? So it's quantum mechanical. Um, so we have, you know, each of the dipeptides Now we, you know, they do it for alanine dipeptide and glycine and proline dipeptides. Um, and that forms the basis of all of the backbone terms. Um, so it's QM energetics in the scans of phi and psi. And then we repeat the calculations with the molecular mechanics um, uh, energies. And it's simply the difference between the two. It's, that's, that's what the surface is, as what C, CMAP is, is the, what is the energy difference for each point on that surface? Um, so it's, it's purely from quantum mechanics. There's, there's no experimental data involved in that. Thanks. Uh, so next one uh, from C. Young Kim. Can I use LJ, the Leonard Jones cutoff free version of Charm 36M in Gromax and which Van der Waals modifier should I use? Um, yes, you can. Um, so, so C36M, so the, the Leonard Jones PME specifically focused on refining the lipids, but again, uh, the, the protein and nucleic acid and all the other parts of the force should be compatible with that. Um, I'll admit I've not used that, that feature, um, but you know, the Van der Waals modifier, it's, it's the LJ PME, whatever the keyword is in Gromax. Um, and so I don't know all of the settings for that. I haven't tested that yet. This is a fairly new thing for the Gromax implementation and I have not really been doing membranes. Um, so I would encourage you to check out that reference, the, the 2021 JCTC paper um, for the methods there in terms of you know, their, their uh, splitting parameters and all that stuff for the, the LJ PME um, and, and see if, if you can reproduce the, the properties they have there, but that's not something I've done yet. So, sorry, I don't really have a great answer for, for that just yet. Yeah, so next one uh, from Roman Patcher. 
which experimental data is mostly used for parameter validation of the force field, so IR or Raman, and how much of experimental data is used in comparison with QM calculations for parameter input? Depends on how much experimental data we have. Um, this is an area in which, you know, we, we really love databases of, of properties of molecules and, and some of the stuff that's, you know, really not glorious to produce, but really, really useful. Um, you know, IR spectra are one. I mean, we, we look principally at vibrational frequency analysis directly from the QM and then directly computed in, in the CHARM program, the, the MOLVIB um, uh, program within CHARM. Um, you know, you can look at IR spectra if you have them. Um, and, and that's one thing, like I said, with the Erie Bradley, you can get asymmetric stretching and that reproduces IR pretty nicely. Um, you know, that's for the bonded parameter stuff. That's actually fairly straightforward. And, and you can direct, take that almost directly from QM and use that. It, it doesn't require a whole lot else. Um, but we would look at things like geometries, you know, like from the, the crystal simulations or something. If a bond length or a valence angle differs a little bit in a real observable physical system, then we're going to tune things a little bit there and, and make a make a compromise with those parameters to get that right. Um, we're really looking when it comes to empirical data, you know, it's it's thermodynamic properties, it's transport properties, you know, diffusion, uh, dielectrics, uh, heat to vaporization, uh, free energy to solvation, that sort of thing. Thanks. Uh, so from QNU, in the paper CHAN 36M, an improved force field for folded and intrinsically disordered proteins on Nature Methods 2016, the authors used many different values of van der Waals and Coulomb cutoff. For example, for the RS peptide, they used a uh, value of both for 9.5 angstroms, but for folded proteins, they use the values you showed. Can you comment on this? And are the values you showed applied for both folded proteins and IDPs? Yeah, so this this is something that my, my sort of hedging answer is, unless you're absolutely certain that what you are using is going to give you a right answer, don't change it. There was a little bit of tinkering with the cutoffs in that paper to ensure robustness of the parameters, that they were not extremely sensitive to the cutoff. And there is, a, you know, to be fair, there's a little bit of wiggle room in what you can do with the non-bonded cutoffs in chart. I don't advocate for that because as a force field developer, I know weird things can show up unpredictably. So please don't take that as an invitation to just completely change things. Uh, it is not dependent necessarily on whether a protein is folded or intrinsically disordered. It is a function of the force field. The cutoffs are always a function of the force field. It was just that they were looking to see if there might be any per, you know, cutoff dependence in what they were doing. So. You know, use the, the, the prescribed force field parameters uh, and, and settings in your MDP files, please. If you do a systematic evaluation and find that the properties are identical with a shorter cutoff or something, I mean, that's, that's okay too. But again, there's a lot of unpredictability when you start hacking at the physical model without knowing exactly why you're doing that. So lots of caution there, but it wasn't because they were just saying certain cutoffs for certain systems, certain cutoffs for others. It was, it was a demonstration of parameter robustness, really. Right, nice. Uh, so next one from Mohammed Suresh. Uh, with the LJ PME, how do you handle force discontinuity at cutoff for the uh, LB combination rule? And how do you avoid endpoint catastrophe in alchemical free energy calculations using LJ PME? Uh, having never done the simulations, I can't tell you. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I can't. Um, I've never done free energy calculations with them. Um, and so uh, probably a good conversation maybe for the, the user form if you want to start talking about use cases or if you're having a problem with that, we can dig into it. Um, but I, I have not used those in simulations yet. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, so another one from C. Young. When you calculate potential energy with Gromax and validate, and validate against Charm, do you use double precision Gromax? No. Cool. The, the, the differences are, you know, again, observable to the third decimal. You're never going to get them right to the sixth decimal. So uh, if, and most people are using the mixed precision anyway. Um, I, I think these days there's certain calculations that you need the, the full double precision, but most people are running standard MD simulations in the mixed precision or, or what we call single precision in Gromax. So if they don't work there, there's no point in, in doing double precision. But yeah, the, the errors show up in a much larger decimal place than, than 
you know, down to full double precision. Uh, so another question: uh, What is penalties? I think this is this was for the yeah the, the penalty calculation. I guess what well, how is that defined? Yeah, the Cjn FF. Um, so that it's the short answer is it is a it's essentially a confidence score. How confident is the program, is the Cjn FF program, that the analogy being assigned is is useful and robust? Um, the exact calculation that goes into that required many pages of explanation in in the relevant article there so please have a look at that if you're interested in how that's actually calculated um, but effectively it's, it's walking through the assigned atom types and how chemically similar or dissimilar they are um, and so how far away are you moving in parameter space uh, to make that analogy um, but the details are all all in the, the jcim paper um, from a few years ago Okay, uh, so another one. Uh, why do you need Network X for the CGenF charm to GMX program? So that is what builds our graph network for the bonded connectivity. Um, so the uh, the charm topology gives you a list of bonds, but then for us to be able to write out angles and dihedrals and assign pairs and all of that stuff, that becomes a graph network, and that's what Network X is being used for. Um, that is something that is under continual development and and this is why versioning becomes important mm -hmm. some of the the new cutting edge versions of network x do not work with our script um, and some of the really old versions also do not work with our script so we attempt to uh, validate against a couple of sort of uh, uh, robust versions in each development lineage the 1.x and the 2.x series um, but if you run into issues if you can, you know, install the version that we print out to the screen of we have validated it with this uh, and, and use that version. They're all available. You can install them through PIP with Python and, and whatever, you know, there's other means to do that. But uh, that's why we sort of advertise which versions we've done it with, because Network X has been particularly finicky uh, as things change. Um, and we've had some very kind user contributions to get us up to speed with some newer versions. Really appreciate that um, and some good feedback for, from people helping us debug that. But, but that's what it's used for. Uh, so a question from uh, Ludovico. Is there any guideline on how to properly fit dihedrals when adjusting from QM to MM? Properly fit. Those words are doing a lot of work. Um, <laughs> how good How good can we get the fit? I mean, there are automated pr uh, programs. There's some, some least square fitting parameters on Alex's site um, that Keno came up with. Um, and that are actually published. You can read about those, um, you know, sort of minimizing the, the differences at each point. Um, you know, if you're doing it sort of empirically and you're toying with it, what are you looking for? You really want the positions of the minima and, and the relative maxima to be pretty spot on because that's what's going to dictate conformational change, um, you know, and, and the subpopulations that you sample in the simulation. Um, but, you know, it's we're trying to get it as closely matched as we possibly can. And, and most of the time using you know, some Monte Carlo simulated annealing fitting or, or just least square fitting uh, in parameter space, you can get them pretty accurately. Um, so, you know, that's, you want to minimize the difference is, is really the answer. And with always with the sort of chemical intuition of, I want to make sure my relative minima and maxima are as close to accurate as possible. If there's one little deviation somewhere, you know, it's not the biggest deal if you've got the rest of that, that energy surface looking good. Uh, so from you, do uh, is intramolecular is intramolecular H bond considered in MP two six thirty one G? Could charm parameters deal with intramolecular interaction well? Does charm F force field use bigger basis set now or future? I'm not quite sure the wording there. Um, I don't I don't know if I fully understand the first question. I mean. Every interaction is considered. I mean, intramolecular hydrogen bonds, if they're relevant in the optimized geometry, yes. You know, that's that's part of the calculation and getting that right. Now, of course, intramolecular hydrogen bonds might be different when you put something in solution, and that becomes a, a challenging part of the fitting in terms of what is the relevant substate when you have, you know, a biomolecule or something else in, in water, because it's going to be competing for the hydrogen bonds. Um, but, you know, that's we, we go with what the data tell us as far as what we're fitting against. And then we have to make sure that, you know, again, we don't make anything overly strong. Um, and then the basis set, um, we've done some larger basis set calculations for things like the nucleic acids, obviously with phosphate groups and things that becomes a bit more of a challenge with 
a greater extent of electron delocalization. Um, so yes, some of that uses a bigger basis set. Um, the charm force field is not really going to change in that regard, though, because if you start changing that, you're, you're changing the entire force field. The polarizable force field that we have, the Drude model, which I didn't talk about at all today, that uses much more, um, uh, you know, larger basis sets, more, more sort of elegant model chemistries. But, but the charm additive force field is going to stick with what it is. Uh, so a question from uh, Gulham. Uh, is there a Python script that translates the charm GUI files to GMX? Is that available? Um, that, well, charm GUI on the back end is using a Python script to convert all of that. So, I mean, if you want that, you'll have to ask the, the charm GUI developers. I don't know whether that's licensed for external use or not, but um, yeah, it exists. I, I know it exists, but um, I don't have one or, or I can't point you to one. Okay, yeah, so we, we have hit the, the hour mark, but if, are you happy to continue with a few more questions, Justin? Sure, um, I can stick around for a little bit, that's fine. Okay, yeah, we can, here's a few more we can go through then. Um, so from, uh, so can you comment on patching residues? So terminal and non-terminal with separate biomolecules for, so e.g. Uh, ubiquitins and PE lipids. Yeah, cross-linking and stuff. Um, there's no ability to do that in Gromax right now. Um, that's one of the areas where it's super easy to do that in Charm. It's, it's a one line command um, and you can patch anything. Um, they have lipid, you know, lipid linkages and things like that for meristylation or, or whatever, you know, acylation you want to do. Um, that's in there, um, but not, it's not implemented in Gromax at this point. I, I'm not sure as far as Charm GUI goes, if they might be able to do that. I think they can do lipid anchoring type stuff. So look into that because then it could output Gromax compatible files if that's what you're after. Uh, so what were the main reasons of removing or not adding new uh, Uri Bradley terms in the modern charm force field? Uh, I'm not aware of any being removed. Um, we use them when we need them. You know, obviously you want to have as, I mean, it's not going to incur any real overhead in the calculation, obviously, but, um, you know, if, if we need an asymmetry in the, in the angle bending, we put it in there. If it's recovered well enough by a symmetric stretch, then then we don't. Um, but I don't. I'm not aware of any being removed unless it was shown that you know for some reason that was a suboptimal uh, parameter ultimately. Um, but it's it's a case by case basis when we're looking at the vibrational uh, uh, frequency analysis. A uh, question from Jean. Uh, so uh, thanks for a nice and clear presentation. Do you have comments or insights on a semi-polarizable charm force field? Semi-polarizable charm force field. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, you know, we, we have the Drude model, which is fully polarizable. Um, everything in the system is polarizable in that case. Um, you know, water, ions, biomolecules, whatever. Um, I don't know of it. I'm not aware of any efforts to make anything, you know, some things polarizable and some things not. I think that would sort of, certainly based on what we've seen, I don't think that would be physically very realistic or useful. Um, but I'm not aware of any efforts to, to, you know, make charm polarizable or something. That's what the Drude lineage sort of, well, I gotta be careful. Drood is not simply polarizable charm. It's derived, it's, its origins are in charm, but it is a separate force field. Um, so you would not want to combine, you know, like let's say, oh, I want polarizable solvent with a non-polarizable solute. That's not something you should be doing with, you know, mixing Drood and charm or something like that. Um, I, I, they're not going to be balanced against one another properly. So um, I don't think that's really anything that anyone's looking into at this point. Uh, so a question from uh, Giuseppe. When it comes to unnatural beta amino acids, are CMAPs as important as they are for standard residues? Can a good optimization of the dihedral terms reduce the error of not having CMAPs computed? Um, I've never worked with beta amino acids, so I can't tell you specifically um, what that would be. Um, I would imagine that anything that involves a polypeptide is going to have to, you know, there, there's going to be some sensitivity to CMAPs and they're going to be somewhat important. Um, you can optimize as well as you want. 
um, you know, in terms of, of the, the phi and the psi, and of course, you know, the connected, you know, chi one dihedrals and things, they all impact one another, right? Everything's, everything's linked. Um, but the reason for CMAP is, you know, those are, those are soft torsions. They're, they're fairly easy to rotate, except when you get into really strained configurations. And there's, there's a lot of sort of coupling between those that's rather quantum mechanical in nature. Um, and, and that's just not something that we have found we've been able to get really good agreement on. Now you're seeing this, of course, like Amber 19, 19 uh, SB um, residue specific C maps saying that each residue is somehow different and not just the polypeptide backbone. There's incredible sensitivity to that. Um, so I really think that that's, that's a critical thing to get right in, in simulations. I don't know if you can just sort of hammer that out just with dihedrals. You can get really close, um, but I think there's always gonna be a little bit of correction that's gonna matter there. Uh, so question from uh, Sondos, I'm doing binding free energy calculations for carbohydrate protein systems in Gromax using JAN36 force field. The van der Waals contribution of the energy always has a negative sign. Is that normal? Um, very hard for me to prejudge uh, uh, the result of a system. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it depends on what it's binding to is, is what I would say. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's unfavorable, um, and that, that could very well be, it just depends on the nature of the interactions that are being, uh, transformed there. So without a lot more context, I, I can't really say, but that, you know, could be a good question for a discussion on the user form. If you're interested in digging into that a little bit more. Um, and a question from Ernest, can polarizable force field be used with Gromax? Yes, uh, with some limitations, um, and they're not officially. So our Druid model is supported. We published an implementation a few years ago. Um, it is not officially in Gromax yet, sorry. Uh, it is in a developmental branch. Um, Alex's website has uh, details on how to do that. Um, it will work on GPU and it will work with OpenMP uh, parallelization. Uh, I fought the dragon of domain decomposition for many years, tracking down some bugs. Uh, we had to do a complete rewrite of it uh, post-publication. Um, you know, everything in the publication still works um, and, and it's valid and what we have implemented is valid, but for robustness in the code, I had to do a lot of rewriting. Um, and then, of course, I took my position here and, and working on that has become a, a little bit of a back burner thing. Um, so you can check out a developmental branch of Gromax that will make that will work. Um, there are some things that are not implemented at the moment. Um, there's no Barristat right now in polarizable simulations just because that's it's easy to do. But I figured I wouldn't implement that until domain decomposition worked. But you can run on GPU. You can run with OpenMP. Um, it's a little limited because we do not have the through space tole screening yet that really gets into um, the bowels of the non bonded neighbor list calculations, which if you do that in a clunky way, your simulations are going to absolutely grind to a halt. Um, so we have to be very careful with that. So with, with a couple of caveats, yes, it works. Um, simple systems work quite well and, and they're quite fast. Um, but they're not officially supported yet. Uh, if you're really interested in that, you know, reach out to me and, and I can answer some questions on that. But uh, it's been a been a long, long haul getting that getting that working. And with some of the new features in the latest Gromax versions, I'm probably going to have to do a bit more rewriting of some things, which ultimately is a good thing. It'll be easier to implement, um, but it's, it's going to require a little bit more work before it's an official feature. Thanks. I think that's all the questions now. So thanks for that. Uh hand back to Alessandra to uh, just sort of finish us off. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all the attendees for the question. Thank you, Justin, it was a great talk. I just want to announce the next occasion. So it will be the 9th of December and we will have a webinar on X3 DNA, the SSR. So please, uh, if you are interested in a visualization of nuclear acid structure, join the webinar. Thank you. And I declare close this webinar. Thank you, everybody.